we have 16 yes and two maybe and we have two eight ten so probably we'll wait like five minutes and uh, maybe like last time just five second introduction just like your name your company and they just quick like either your wallet l2 or uh, that or something like that so uh hi my name is Makoto and then I work at ENS. Uh, Adrian is frozen or do I, am I frozen? Nick is not frozen, but everybody else is frozen. Interesting. You're not frozen to me. Nick, can you hear me? Yeah, but everybody else is frozen. Shall we? Like all the ENS people are not frozen. I, I can see everyone. Shall we just work our way down the list? Okay. Uh, Alf, uh, alphabetically, Brantley. Brantley. All right, uh, everything's fine for me. Uh, now Brantley is it, It's It's just you, don't worry. <laughs> uh, do you want to introduce yourself, Brantley? Okay, yeah, I, uh, I, I'm from the ENS team. Brantley Milligan. And uh, Brendan Weinstein. Hey, uh, I'm from the Coinbase wallet team. Hey, Brendan. Uh, Chris. Hey, I'm Chris, uh, working on Ethereum. Hey, uh, EG. Hey, everybody. Good to see a lot of you. I haven't seen you in a long time. I'm I'm EG. I'm one of the co-founders of Infira. Uh, work on node infrastructure. Cool. Long time we'll see. Uh, Adrian Yang, maybe. Hey, I'm working Adrian. for iExec. I'm also a contributor to okay. ENS login. And uh, Harry? Uh, hey, I'm Harry, uh, working on a general purpose optimistic rollup called Arbitrum. Cool. Uh, Jordi? Hello. Right now I'm working, I'm Jordi, I'm working right now in Hermes. It's a ZK rollup, and I'm also the, the developer of uh, ZK, uh, of Circom and Snark.js. Cool. Uh, Joe, Joe. <laughs> hey, thank right. you. Um, so I don't work directly on the code. Uh, I'm here to advise on naming stuff with ENS. Uh, I'm one of the key volunteers on the public suffix list. And I'm also the um, co-chair of the um, registry registrar technical operations within ICANN's registry and registrar stakeholder groups. So I'm here to kind of inform that process. Cool. Thanks. Uh, I think Joe just jumped in. Joe, do you want to do like three seconds? Hey guys, it's uh, Joe from Aztec. Uh, it's running a bit late. Um, yeah, excited to see how we can uh, uh, get ENS domains working on our layer two. Cool. And Luis. Hi guys, uh, Louis Goodman. I'm working. Uh, at Starkware, product manager, and uh, Starkware being a scavity solution using Starks. Cool. Uh, Mohamed? Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Mohamed Sarkalu, uh, working for Golem and Almonix at the same time. Cool. Uh, Neiman Lib? Yeah. Hi, I'm Neiman. Um, so I work with Mohamed at Almonix. Uh, I'll leave Nick to the last. Uh, Rich? Richard? Oh, hi, hi. Uh, Richard Moore. I'm with E3JS and Firefly. Hey. Uh, Shane? Hey, guys. Shane Fontaine. I work with Chris on Ethereum. Cool. Uh, I think about half the people were 
in the last meeting and they kind of have people new. Uh, I did put the, uh, in an invitation email, I did put the uh, last uh, time meeting minutes and hopefully people are aware of like what's going on. But uh, I, I, I saw like Nick also tweet that he has something exciting to show us. So I'll just pass it on to Nick. Yeah, so I thought it would make sense to start with a quick demo of, uh, of uh, well, a demo that I've built uh, based on our discussions last time and a few further thoughts. Um, so before I do that, like a, a quick summary of, of our problem and, and what we're trying to do. Um, the basic idea, the sort of generic overarching idea behind L2s in general, I would say, uh, is the idea is that the data for that an L2 stores or executes is not stored on chain, but it's possible to verify the uh, data or the results of an L2 computation on L1 on Ethereum. And so the question, the, the issue we have here is how can something that uh, has a connection to the L2 L1 to Ethereum uh, obtain a result from L2 verify it and verify it's correct without having to care about the specific l2 that's involved uh, how to communicate with it anything like that so how can we build a generic bridge between ethereum and l2s such that it's possible to both fetch data and then verify it's correct without having to know uh, you know write code for each user for each uh, each specific l2 so the basic idea we came up with in the last session is is basically this we have uh two um sort of uh, components involved here. We have the contract and we have some sort of gateway. Uh, what happens is uh, if you want to fetch data, uh, you go and you make this function call that you would originally, that you want the answer to, to the uh, contract on L1 on Ethereum. And instead of giving you back the answer because it doesn't have the information necessary, it gives you back two pieces of information, a prefix, which I'll get into in a minute, and a gateway URL. And the gateway URL specifies a service that can answer your question for you. Uh, then you go and you consult that gateway using that URL. You send the exact same function call data to it again, and you get back uh, some uh, an opaque blob of data. You don't have to care what's in this blob of data. The only thing you do care is that you check that it starts with the prefix the contract gave you. And the reason for this check is to make sure that this gateway can't give you back the answer to an unrelated query that uh, happens to return the result it wants you to get. So the contract can specify uh, which parts of this call data must be fixed. Uh, and then you take this call data you got back and you call the original L1 contract with it. Um, and the L1 contract uh, with that call data, which is application specific, now has all the information it needs to uh, both produce the result that you want and to verify that that result is correct. Uh, so I've put together a simple example here, uh, which I can go over with all of you. So first of all, let me skip to uh, l2gateway.js. This is the implementation of that protocol I just described. And we have two things. We have call L2 function and transact L2 function, which do more or less what you'd think. And they conduct that exact three-step process. So they're given a ethers.js contract object, the name of the function to call and the arguments to call it with. And they go through the first two steps here. First, they encode the call data to the function. They call the contract on chain, asking it uh, for the uh, prefix and the gateway URL. And then they make an HTTP POST request to the gateway URL and get back some opaque call data. They check that it starts with the required prefix. And then finally, they call the original contract again with that opaque blob of data. And what they get back is the result of the function call. So a concrete example here, this, I'm calling this an L2 gateway, but really this is a way to turn any query that involves off-chain data into a, uh, a query that you can do without having to know where that data comes from or what it looks like. So I've got here a really simple ERC20 token. This ERC20 token has an airdrop type thing, uh, but instead of putting all the balances in the contract, we just have a miracle root that attests to the, the root of all the airdrops. Uh, and it knows about the gateway that can answer questions about that miracle tree. So what we want people to be able to do is call functions like this. Uh, claimable balance with proof takes an address, a balance, and a proof, 
And if the proof is valid, it returns the, the claimable balance for that address. Claim with proof takes the same address, balance and proof. And if the proof is valid, then it credits that account with the amount in the Merkle airdrop. And we have this big list of addresses in our airdrop that we've uh, constructed a Merkle tree over. Um, so these are the things we want users to be able to call, but we don't want them to have to care about any of the parameters other than the address. So we implement the same protocol. We've got this claim function, which itself doesn't answer the, uh, the question, but it takes the address and it returns a prefix and a URL. In this case, the URL is always a fixed URL, and the prefix is uh, basically saying that it will be a call to Merkle token .claim with proof, and it will start with the address, which is what prevents the gateway from giving you the answer to somebody else's token balance. Same for claim level balance. Um, it uh, takes the address and it returns a prefix, which says it will be a call to claim level balance with proof, and it will start with the address. Uh, and then finally, we have the gateway, uh, which actually does all of this. Uh, and I'll check that I've got the right, yep. So uh, this is our node.js express JS service, uh, and it has handlers for each of these things. So uh, when it gets a post to the query address, it looks up the appropriate handler, and we'll look at the claimable balance function, for instance. Um, it gets passed in the address from the claimable balance function. Uh, it looks up, uh, and the, the details of this aren't terribly important, but it looks it up inside this big JSON file, the Merkle tree it built from it, and it constructs a proof. Uh, and then it returns the encoded data for a call to that function. Uh, so notably in this case, this service doesn't even need a blockchain connection. All it needs is the big blob of data. But if this was a service that was acting as a gateway to say Optimism or any other L2, it would have a connection to the L2 node and it would be able to go and fetch this data and construct Merkle proofs or whatever other sort of proofs since it's not dependent on Merkle proofs. An example, you could have another token that relies on signed messages for its airdrop data, and it would work exactly the same way from a user's point of view. And so this is our um, very simple web app, which demos all of this. And you can see that it never deals with, uh, with anything called a Merkle proof. It never deals with, with any parameter other than the account. So this is how it fetches the claimable balance. It literally just does call LT function. Here's the token. Here's the function I want to call. Here's the account and it gets the result just the same as if it had made a regular uh, ETH, uh, JSON RPC call to a, a function and gets it. Uh, so I have all of this in demoable form. If I can find the appropriate tab, there we go. So here is our uh, ridiculously simple web app. Uh, it's fetching that just using the standard balance of function of ERC20, and it's fetching this using the uh, layer two um, system. Um, and then if I click claim tokens, it performs the same dance. Uh, and this time it gets back transaction data, uh, some transaction data, and we just claimed our tokens on chain without the web app having to ever know anything about Merkle proofs or anything about how any of it works. Um, and this is of course applicable to ENS as well. Uh, the way we can do it with ENS is simply that um, resolvers have similar functionality where the resolve uh, the um, Functions to resolve names are of the same format. Instead of returning the result, uh, they return a URL of a gateway and a way to prove the result, a uh, uh, prefix for the result. And then you go off and get it, you pass it back a second time, it proves the result is correct. And we can build a separate gateway and a separate resolver implementation for each L2. And the resolvers of ENS names never have to care uh, which L2 it is, what the proof looks like, they just pass it around as an opaque blob. Um, there's two sort of avenues, the two things we need to refine on this that have occurred to me so far, and I'm sure there's others I missed. Uh, one of them is that presently this relies on the contract embedding the gateway URL itself. And so for applications like ENS where you have a level of indirection, this is perfect because you want the owner of the name to be able to say, you know, here is how to resolve my name, use this gateway. And if that gateway goes offline or they want to change their L2 or whatever, they can update it. It's up to them to maintain their name. But this is less ideal in other use cases, like if you want, like in the, uh, the Merkle token drop example, or if you wanted like a Uniswap gateway or something like that, really you want to be able to fork the UI and you want to be able to supply your own gateway just as easily. Um, so it's not ideal in the cases where there's less indirection to be embedding this gateway URL uh, in the contract. So really, we need to come up with some sort of solution if we pursue this that works for both 
uh, with the indirection, something like ENS where it's dynamically specified, or without the indirection where really you want the gateway to be a parameter of the front end so that you can fork it and, and specify your own just as easily. Um, the second issue I've identified is that uh, at present, there's no way to distinguish between the gateway giving you a blob of data that causes the, tra uh, the call to revert, uh, and uh, simply it's giving you accurate data, but the call you want to make will always revert. You can't tell uh, bad data from correct data that gives a bad result. Um, the obvious way around this is that we could simply say that the verification function must revert with a specific code or message. Um, that specifies the validation failed, and if it's any other revert reason, then you know that it's uh, down to the application. But I'm open to other suggestions for how we can sort of solve that issue as well. Uh, so that's the very quick overview. If you would like to look at this, it is available on github.com slash ENS domain slash L2 gateway dash demo. Uh, questions? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure if you covered this because I, I joined halfway, but uh, who updates the Merkle root on L1 and how do you decentralize that? Uh, so this is really up to the individual uh, L2 or whatever system it is. So if you look at uh, Optimism, the L2 I'm most familiar with at the moment, um, they have a sort of a stub contract on Ethereum, and its job is to keep the L2, uh, the Merkle root of the L2 state up to date. Uh, so in the case that you were building an interface with this, your contract would call out to that and, and fetch the Merkle root from there and generate its proofs based on that. And so that's a a question for the individual L2s to solve. OK, I was uh, talking about the Merkle root on the uh, the contract that you had, the, the custom contract. Uh, so I mean, the, the, the example I have in this case is just for like a really simple airdrop. The Merkle root is actually fixed. Uh, the idea is that when you deploy the token, you, you say this is the set of preloaded balances. Um, you could build whatever mechanism you wanted into here for this. Uh, another example where this could be useful, for instance, is if you wanted a token that doesn't store the balances on chain, um, you could actually, you know, have the the transfer functions could be of the same form. They accept a proof and they output events that are necessary to construct an updated proof. Um, and therefore, you can have a much cheaper uh, token. The nice thing about this, and something I didn't explicitly mention, is that you could build this L2 gateway functionality into something like ethers.js. Uh, and the uh, you know have a, a new keyword for your ABI, something like indirect. And when it sees that keyword, it automatically performs this three-step dance and gets back the result. Uh, the application doesn't actually have to know whether this is a regular on-chain token or whether it's an indirect token. Uh, it just gets the result either way. Gotcha. In the case of uh, ENS, uh, though, like who would maintain the Merkle root? Uh, so in the case of ENS, uh, you know, we have this... Uh, this indirection in ENS where you have the registry and each name's owner points to a resolver. And in this case, the resolver would specify its gateway URL. So if I uh, own a name, I can specify the gateway that I want to use and therefore the L2 that I want to use. Um, and what we would do probably is we would write a resolver for each L2 and somebody, either us or the L2 or a third party, would host gateways for that resolver. Um, and so those uh, those two components together allow you to basically, as a user, you can go, okay, I want to use, uh, you know, this L2, and I'll use this gateway, or I'll host my own, or whatever, uh, for interfacing with it. I see. Okay, so um, so your uh, the use case you're um, envisioning is only for the resolution and not for you know purchasing an L2 and then claiming an L1. That's right. So um, the making updates like this provides for read operations from an L2. Uh, using this interactive protocol, and it provides for making an update on L1 using data that comes from L2, um, but it doesn't provide for making changes on an L2. Uh, that will be something that still requires individual interaction. And I think due to the, the diversity and sort of uh, heterogeneity of L2s, that will be necessary. You know, if you, if you want to do it on a, a UTXO-based chain, then that's going to be quite different from doing it on a, uh, an EVM-based chain. I see. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was confused a little bit because you showed uh, the uh, ERC twenty token example with the, with the claim flow. So I, I thought like you were uh, envisioning a use case where people can buy took uh, you know uh, domains and L two and somehow claim them in L one. In which case, uh, it'll it'll be difficult to determine like who maintains the Merkle root 
that's required yeah. uh, for the claims, uh, and like de decentralizing that would be would be also, would also be difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So you more or less can have something like that um, in that I could buy you know my L two dot ETH and I could set it up so you can buy subdomains on Optimism, for instance. Um, you would still have to interact with Optimism to buy the subdomains, but then you could use something like this both to resolve for anyone to resolve the name but also potentially you could have a claim on L1 function that then pushes your domain into L1 so that you no longer, uh, that older resolvers can resolve it and so forth. Um, that's that's hey, exciting. Julian. The subdomain idea is really exciting, actually. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and that's related to something that Hadrian brings up, says you'll also need to set that for all subdomains, um, which is, yes, the other step to all of this, to implementing something like this is for it to be practically useful and we need to change the resolution process in a way that uh, you are able to do effectively wildcard domains. So if you try and look up a domain that doesn't exist, you look at the parent domain and ask it to resolve it instead. Um, and you know that's that's a st that's um, something we need to add regardless. And obviously if we're going to be making changes to the process of resolving names, uh, then it's a good idea to make all of these changes at once, but also to keep it as, as a minimal and uh, easy to follow, uh, easy to, to resolve as possible. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, ideas, etc.? Um, just to clarify, are there certain trust assumptions with the L2 gateway? Uh... Um, so the, the gateway has very little scope for misbehavior. They can, uh, they can try and do several things. They can be unavailable, which obviously, you know, we, we can't avoid. Um, data availability being effectively impossible without pushing everything to L1. Um, but beyond that, uh, if they attempt to produce uh, an invalid proof, then the L1 contract can, can reject that. Um, if they attempt to produce a valid proof but for the wrong, uh, the wrong query, then the prefix uh, prevents that, which is something I identified was an issue with our previous proposal. Um, the the reason I've done it as a prefix is because it's very straightforward to validate. And in the case where the arguments are all fixed length, it's literally just the arguments you passed into the original function. In the case where they're variable length because of the nature of uh, ABI encoding, you'd need to make the prefix a, a hash commitment over the, the things that shouldn't change. Gotcha. Does that assume that you're trusting whatever Merkle root came from the, the roll-up? Though, like if the optimistic uh, Merkle root came down, and then the uh, the gateway says, you know, here's the proof to include to prove inclusion in this Merkle proof. We can't trust this Merkle proof for another, you know, week or so. Uh, yeah. So the idea is, yes, the the assumption is that the um, the Merkle root is valid outside any sort of challenge mechanism that the L2 has. So. Uh, again, I, I'm not, Optimism is the only um, L2 I'm, I'm moderately familiar with so far, so forgive me continuing to reference it. Um, in that case, for instance, you, you need to base your changes on the, the route that is returned as, you know, post-dispute process, which does mean that if there is a dispute period, your updates are delayed by that much, which in some cases may be an issue and in other cases may be a non-issue simply because like looking at ENS for instance, generally people are pretty accepting if their name updates uh, take an hour because that's how the internet works as well. Uh, if it was, you know, trading on Uniswap, then you might be a little less tolerant of that. Um, but of course you can build any sort of proof mechanism in here that you want. You could potentially build a an interface contract and a gateway that relies on messages signed by attestors that are staking a deposit. And although you wouldn't have a mechanism to go back and, uh, you know, s say to the person who got an incorrect result, sorry, that was incorrect, you would have a way to uh, severely penalise the attester. Um, so you can still build those same sort of economic gains into it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my thought from a security perspective is that this would be really good at keeping someone from resolving your name to something that you don't want but it would allow you to say like, here's a malicious gateway, uh, resolve a name that I own to something that, that isn't actually true on chain. But I, I don't see any issues with that, but I'm wondering if you know of any use cases where that could be used maliciously. Yeah, so the sort of the trust model is that like, um, if you trust the resolver or whatever contract is implementing this to answer you correctly for on-chain queries, 
then you should also trust it to tell you where to go for off-chain queries. The, the trust model is always that uh, you've analyzed that code or the or that the code is you know pointed to by somebody who has an incentive to give you the correct result. So in the case of ENS, you know, right now I could write a resolver that every time you resolve nick.eth that gave you a random address. Um, but I only stand to lose by doing that. Okay. It, it seems like kind of, yeah, fundamentally the model seems to be that the kind of the gateway isn't trusted at all. The kind of contract that resolves proofs from the gateway essentially bakes in whatever trust model. So I can imagine for kind of an optimistic rollup, you might have two different contracts. You might have one type where it was kind of, it's going to give you proofs against kind of the, the most recent totally committed, already fraud checked kind of output from the rollup versus mm -hmm. kind of a, a different one where um, it was resolving based on someone staking some amount of funds that the result that the output from the rollup would be a certain amount and that kind of the the difference between those two security models and I you know let's say for a proof of stake sidechain you might have kind of the the stakers signing updates and committing to a merkle root that way essentially kind of all of the L2 specific stuff seems to be just kind of now baked into that sort of contract which is really nice yeah yeah, so you as a, a, an owner of a name or anything else that wants to interface with L2, you can choose your trust model uh, up to date, but slightly risky or older, but you know, more more certain. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, if I miss anything, uh, I want to ask about uh, like uh, the, uh, the other resolver operations, like uh, setting content hash uh, in, in, in layer two level. So is it possible? to apply this? Yes, so the idea is uh, that all of those would still be things that, like write operations would still be things that are L2 specific. So we can provide ENS interfaces to, you know, sorry, ENS resolution will be universal, uh, but updates will require support for, for each individual L2. And in some cases that may be straightforward and that if it's another EVM L2, we can provide a standard EVM uh, interface, you know, and then just point it at each of them. Uh, in, for, in the case of non-EVM L2s, it's still possible, but a little more involved. Uh, so one, uh, one example process that I think I mooted at the previous meeting is that even if all your L2 supports is storage of static data, you can still do dynamic resolution because what you can do is you can say, well, there's a resolver on L1 and here is a blob of data that if you passed it to the resolver would configure that resolver to resolve my name. So your interface contract using this L2 step, the proof data it gets back would be that blob of data. And what it would do is it would inside a single call, it would pass that blob of data to the resolver and then it would call the resolver to resolve the name and get back the result. And then because this is a local call, all of those state changes just vanish into the ether, so to speak. Um, so you can actually still get the full set of functionality, even with a very low functionality L2. Um, the only thing is that you, um, you know, if it's a different model, then we have to build our own support for write operations to that. Um, fortunately, though, you know, that's something the L2s and the ENS team need to worry about, not every single person who wants to resolve name, which is the really important thing for us, I think, is making sure that resolution never has to worry about these details. OK, good. Thank you. Uh, question on the event that, uh, for example, like a list of uh, text record or uh, point type which we set uh, currently mm -hmm. We can't really like from the ENS app. We can't really just query one by one. So we rely heavily on something like a, the graph protocol, and they, they kind of index as you know events. Given you start resolving in uh, L2, how does that impact for something like a graph or deal analytics or even the ESA scan where they are kind of doing lots of indexing work? Yeah, that's something we would also have to do on a pure L2 basis. Like the storing a storing a blob of data solution, like we could adopt that even for more capable L2s. And then the ENS app could simply use some, uh, you know, L2 specific way to grab that blob of data and then just analyze it to say, here are your complete set of set records and, you know, go through and change them as you wish. Um, that's basically up to us and the individual, you know, the individual gateways we build. Um, and of course, anyone else can build their own gateway that uses some other, you know, method. Um, 
you can have a uh, an L2 that actually has like dynamic execution where the, the resolution is executed on the L2 and then you provide a complete state proof of the execution trace to the L1. Um, you know, that's getting a bit involved and it's probably not necessary here, but it's the sort of thing you can do. Um, I think in, the, in our case, like in terms of the ENS team, we'll probably find an approach that works and is tractable and, and works across, is likely to work across a lot of L2s and then implement it as widely as we can with as little per L2 effort as possible. Thanks. Did you answer all the questions in the chat? I think so. Hang on, there's probably new ones. Uh, isn't there something proof of stake? Sidechain's already doing validators for Matic, already published state transaction receipt routes of the sidechain. Yes. So they're doing all of the stuff that's necessary for us to do this. Like that's the sort of the fundamental assumption is that um, this data is available on chain. But the difference is that at the moment, each one, each L2 has its own mechanism for doing this and its own uh, proof format and so forth. And even if they wanted to agree on a standard, that's not even necessarily tractable because some L2s might use Merkle proofs with KCAT 256, some might use Merkle proofs with Blake 3, some might use BLS signatures, you know, and, and those, are, those are fundamental internal details about how they operate. They can't easily all conform to the same standard and we need some sort of common standard um, in order to be able to resolve across all chains independently. And uh, the useful thing here is that, that well, basically, we just add a layer of indirection, which is the answer to all problems in computer science. Um, and, and presto, we can, we can get these results. So they're definitely pushing all of this data, but it's in formats that are non-universal, that are very uh, heterogeneous. Uh, and Joe Andrews says, uh, we have the concept of stale data routes on Aztec, as we also have a nullifier tree. I wonder if proofs from the last N data routes could be used to resolve domains. So even if you have an old Merkle proof, it would be valid for N L2 blocks. Uh, it would be useful for ensuring redundancy if the gateway goes down. We will add ENS propagation delays into the system, kind of like adding DNS delay propagations in the real world. And that raises an interesting point, which is that, um, you know, Merkle proofs, the proof you need changes every block. So I, the latent assumption here is that there is some way to generate a proof that you can use against the original contract for at least a few seconds, at least whatever the period is between the gateway, fetching the proof, generating it, giving it back to you. Um, and I think that's probably a reasonable assumption because the whole usefulness of these L2s depends on being able to push data back to L1 when necessary. Um, but, you know, we'll need to, to spend more time working with individual L2s to see what this runs into. And I guess I'd be interested, like, those of you who are here either representing an L2 or are intimately familiar with one, uh, do you see any barriers to this solution working with your, uh, you know, your L2? I mean, I mean, it seems more of a more of a feature of the of the L1 kind of um, verifier contract, or I don't know what what exactly we're, we're calling these, but I mean, kind of handling the multiple Merkle routes seems to be as simple as kind of having a, a circular buffer. Um, that just kind of remembers the last n roots and kind of overwrites them. Um, so it doesn't really seem like something that would add any complexity. I, I really like how kind of encapsulated everything is. So I mean, the, the kind of the main piece of kind of L2 specific complexity here is always going to be just kind of getting the Merkle root from the L2 into whatever that, in, into kind of your, your L1 contracts. Yeah. Yeah. And I, like, I, I'm quite, uh, I quite like the idea that potentially a library like Ethers or even a, something a library built on top of Ethers could just integrate this so that we can have dApps everywhere using this for all manner of things without necessarily even realizing that they're relying on an L2. Um, it, it mean it brings the uh, the JSON RPC function, you know, solidity function call uh, model to to L2s like heterogeneous ones without having to care about which they are. Um, uh, Pete Kim in the chat asks, uh, outdated DNS resolutions usually aren't as potentially damaging as outdated ENS resolutions. I, uh, I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, I would say that both tend to be updated reasonably and frequently. And when you're updating either, you have to assume that there's some period where people will get either the old one or the new one. Um, 
and that it would be unusual in either case for you to, to make some enormous change that where if somebody gets yesterday's result or, or rather, you know, earlier today's result, uh, the consequences would be dire. The, the worst result is uh, if you can get the old result and then the new result and then the old result again, that's a bit more problematic um, and, and gets a bit more complicated. But I don't think we're, we're introducing the possibility of that necessarily. Well, I think one, one other uh, kind of thing to be clear about here is just like so that the, the interface is essentially defi defined in a way, and kind of the very generic example you started with is defined in a way where it kind of treats it as though it's like a call. Um, whereas kind of it seems like in implementation most of the time, it's going to be sort of much more static than that. I mean, so for example, let's say the Merkle tree is a key value store and the call is to look up a value associated with a key. Um, since we're not actually doing any um, complex evaluation in the L2, well, I guess unless maybe maybe for maybe for kind of the the zk based solutions, they might actually you know have be able to kind of have more sophisticated proofs. But I'm imagining at least for, from kind of an optimistic roll up point of view, this works perfectly for the ENS use case where we're kind of really what we want to do is return a blob of data associated with some input. Um, where we're kind of looking up in a database, but for kind of other, it's not, it's not super generic. I think it's, it's you know, it's, it's perfect for this use case. Yep. Is it, can you think of, of applications that this doesn't apply to so well because of that? Because I, I ultimately you could produce like uh, any, you know, a proof sufficient to prove that this code executes on L2 and produces this result, but that gets a bit complicated. Yeah, essentially just that. I mean, that you you need to you're you're running you're running some code on L1 based on kind of based on a commitment to the current state of the L2, and so essentially, you know, there there are limiting factors in terms of, for instance, if it is a if the, if the Merkle root is a you know a Ethereum state tree, let's say equivalent. Um, you need to look up every. You need to include in your proof every single storage field, and you need to actually do all the computation. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so ideally, like to keep that straightforward from both an implementation and a sort of an execution cost point of view, you want to make it as little data and as little computation as possible. Um, but I think that that's still tractable because in a lot of cases, it's not the volume of data that's requiring us to use an L2, it's the rate of updates of data that's requiring it. Um, so it can still be very useful just to be able to read smallish amounts of data without caring about the implementation details. Um, Absolutely, yeah. A few more uh, chat comments. Um, uh, Lewis asks, uh, not sure if I'm grasping everything yet, but it seems that the verification is done against the L1 contract. Would the proof verification function have to be implemented as part of the L1 contract? Yes, that's right. So um, it, to some degree, like each application needs to write its own verification logic but they should be able to leverage the stuff that that L2 has written for them. You know, the, the, the L2 presumably will have provided functionality for uh, here is how to validate a Merkle proof, for instance. Um, Hadrian says, the original proposal by Vitalik included the gateway being committed through stakes so they can be punished if the results turn out wrong. Uh, this required the results to include a block number. All of that is gone, right? Yes. Uh, as, the idea is, and, and you know, I think in the previous call, Vitalik acknowledged that if we restructure it like this, um, you don't necessarily need a stake because it's no longer possible for the gateway to meaningfully lie to you. The best, the worst it can do is be unavailable, really. Um, uh, sorry, I, I think I, I think I might have missed this. Is a gateway URL supposed to be the JSON RPC URL uh, that's uh, supposed to speak the normal the Ethereum JSON RPC protocol? So presently, I'm just using like for the demo. I'm just using a really basic, um, you know, send a blob of JSON, a, a JSON dict uh, with content type application JSON, um, and get back a JSON dict. I'm not attempting to be JSON RPC compatible for this case. Uh, I think uh, when we get into the nitty gritty of standardizing this, it's a reasonable conversation to have. Personally, I kind of hate JSON RPC, um, but. I'm not prepared to get that, let that get in the way of like building something sensible. Um, so I don't know. You know, I think that's uh, we can leave that up to later details. Um, 
it would be nice if we didn't replicate all of the shortcomings of JSON RPC just because we want to, you know, be sort of compatible. Uh, I think posting a blob and getting a blob back, or you know, a dict and getting a dict back is light enough weight that you know it may be easy enough just to say that's how we're doing it. I see. Okay, in that case, then there is a little bit of uh, extra trust involved because the the uh, the gateway will have to be hosted and run by somebody. I'm assuming, right? That, yeah, that will be the case regardless. It's less a matter of trust and more a, a, a either a centralization risk or a, um, a reliability issue. Um, yes, all the gateways need to use the same interface. I'm just saying that it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, JSON RPC. Um, so that's one thing I, I brought up with the whole like encoding the URL into the, uh, into the contract. Um, and I, I'm curious if anyone has a better solution. So basically uh, in the case like ENS, it does, you do want that layer of indirection because you want the individual name owners to be able to say, this is the gateway for my name and I take responsibility for making sure it's, it's up and running and so forth because that's the, the trust domain effectively. Um, in the I case of- okay. It's like running a name case, server almost, yeah. It is, yeah, exactly. And just like running a name server, you can delegate that job to someone else. Uh, unlike running a name server, or at least pre, uh, you know, DNS sec, uh, you don't have to rely on them to give accurate answers because they can't lie. Um, the but in the case where you have less indirection with things like the token example or Uniswap or something like that, really you don't want the URL to be embedded into the contract because you want to be able to easily fork the front end, and part of doing that would be having the ability to run your own gateway. So if anyone can see a an elegant way to refine the protocol so that you can either return the gateway as part of the, the first query, or you can specify it uh, without just, I mean, obviously you can do that just by saying here is the override gateway URL, but it would be nice if applications that don't want that in direction don't have to deal with this. You know, they, they, um, they don't have that extra useless parameter return from the first call. Um, but applications that do need it can do it without adding a whole lot of extra overhead. Uh, uh, Makoto asks if uh, all subdomains of status.ether and L2, uh, so that matoken.status.ether is an L2, can you set a reverse record against it? Uh, so yes, reverse records are just uh, basically a bit of text associated with your address. Um, there is the process of verifying that that's correct before displaying it. Like every app that shows a reverse name should first go in and uh, check that that forward resolution matches. Uh, not all of them do, but, um, and in the case they do that, if they don't yet support this L2 standard, then they will think it's an invalid thing uh, and they won't show you a reverse record. But if they do support the L2 standard, then they'll look it up using this process and they will show it correctly. Um, Where would uh, Jack happen? Would, would that be on L1 or L2? Uh, so at present, uh, reverse records would all remain on L1 because uh, the only real way we could L2ify them would basically be to push the entire registry, the entire reverse registry to one specific L2. I mean, as the owner of the reverse record, you could put that on L2, like just that record. Um, but I can't think of very many cases where you would need to update your reverse record so often that you you care about you know transaction costs and pushing it to L2 and all the the, the hassle of doing that in the first place. But um, in that case, if if we're dealing with the optimistic rollup, um, I, I could see that being a case where it, you know if I could say that I own some subdomain that's registered on oh, you know on optimism that that could be used maliciously. Uh, so then I think we get to the point where we need to, to trust that state group coming from, from optimism, right? The, so the, the trust model is more or less that the owner of the name gets to decide what risks they're willing to accept in correct resolution of their name. So if they pick a gateway that, that have relies on weak trust assumptions, uh, then they're vulnerable to that, but they're also the party that has the incentive to secure their name. So if, if I'm a party that is trying to set a reverse record for a name that I don't own, though. Yes. So the, the, 
the process for doing reverse resolution is that you first do the reverse resolution to get the name they claim as their canonical name. And then the second step, you look up that name of the forward resolution and you see if it actually matches that address. And so I could set an unreliable reverse resolver that claims names I don't have, but then step two isn't under my control, so I can't force it to point to my address. But if, but if the subdomain's on uh, the OVM and I'm setting a reverse record for that, how, how would you verify that I own the OVM record without trusting the OVM state root? So I, I'm not quite sure if I, if I follow. The, if I um, say, say Makoto has set up my token.status.eth uh, and status.eth is on the OVM and I want to claim I actually, my address is matoken.status.eth. Yeah. I can set uh, my reverse record as matoken.status.eth. Anyone looking it up will get my address, look up that, and then they'll try and do a forward resolution of matoken.status.eth. Um, whether you believe in the L2 or not, uh, if Makoto selected a gateway that is secure and returns correct results, then it will return his address instead of mine, and they won't match, and so it won't. Uh, the reverse resolution won't complete and it will say there's no reverse record effectively or not no valid one but it sorry I, we, we can talk about it offline but uh the like i don't have to listen to the gateway if i'm doing the reverse uh like say say makoto set the the gateway and then i do the forward resolution and i look at the gateway that makoto set and then i just give my own answer yeah, you, you know, my own, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the malicious state route, uh, then I've kind of circumvent, like circumvented the, the uh, gateway that Makoto has set and I've been able to, you know, show a, a valid. But a you, valid can only lie, you can only lie to yourself. Like you can only force yourself to consult the wrong gateway. You can't force anyone else who's reverse resolving your name to consult your fake gateway. Okay. Um, just looking through the chat again, um, uh, another thing we should be mindful of that is that this makes ENS no longer standalone and it will depend on DNS. Uh, it's an interesting point in that, um, like you have to resolve the gateway address somehow. You could literally just push IP addresses in there. You don't have to use DNS names, but then of course you can't really use SSL. Um, we can specify this gateway for other protocols than HTTP. The reason I suggested HTTP is because it's well established and uh, you know and easy to work with. Um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting change in the trust model. I think of it as because you can update the gateway URL at any time if you know a name is taken down or you know is controlled by uh, a country that has a little respect for property rights or whatever threat model you want to exhibit. Uh, because you can update it, I don't think it's. Uh, a significant threat risk, but it's it's a discussion worth having. Um, uh, hey, I think, yeah, uh, there's a sorry, there is a, a state question or, or a statement earlier from me that uh, you can read out a few possible gateways, not just one. Yes, yeah. So I, I wasn't sure whether we should speak out that it should return a list or just one. Uh, even if it just returns one, the contract could internally have a list and it just picks them round robin, you know, pseudo randomly. Um, or you can return a list and then the, the caller decides which of those to call or, or iterates through them until it finds one that's reliable. Um, I think that's also something we should explore in, in specifying any of this. Um, the... Uh, Sorry, uh, yeah, Hadrian says Argent would care about the price of reverse registering its users. If they can't do it out through L2, we'll keep rec gaps in the reverse registry. That's a fair point. Um, if, you're, if you're a wallet and you're looking at this as a way that you can now mass issue ENS names because it becomes affordable to do on L2, if you still have to do reverse resolution on L1, often it's just not going to happen. Um, so I, you know, off the top of my head, I don't have an immediate solution, but it's that's also something we should think about. Uh, longer term, perhaps we can just say, you know, longer term, perhaps there will be an obvious winner to the L2 where everything is using standard X, and we can just say, okay, we're going to deploy an ENS instance of this, and the reverse registry will be there, DNSSEC records will be there, 
you know, everyone can still use multiple L2s, but these core components will be on this particular L2. But I don't think that's the thing we want to commit to just yet. Um, and Rick, Richard points out you could also use IPFS. It's a good point. Like, um, your L2 can be anything you can commit a root to. So if Argent wants to issue names to everybody, they could publish a Merkle tree in IPFS, and then they could link to the to that from uh, the system, and you could look it all up via that. Um, and that's how your gateway can function. Potentially, we could change the specs so that we support IPFS URLs and say, if it's an IPFS URL, it is in this format, you know, rather than being an interactive service. Um, but I wouldn't want to restrict us to just that because I think the um, interfacing with every L2 will require a degree of customized logic, and we definitely don't want to push that to the result to the clients that execute this. So unless somebody has a really clever idea around how to build that functionality into IPFS. Uh, that isn't go load this blob of JavaScript off IPFS and execute it inside your browser because I see some issues with that. Um, then I think we'll still need the option for an interactive gateway. Um, we've got only a few minutes left. I'd be really interested to hear both uh, from L2, particularly from anyone who's working on L2 and anyone who's working on a wallet. Beyond just ENS, does this seem like a useful thing you'd like to see implemented more widely that would be useful for your L2 or useful for your wallet? He was killed in London yesterday. I definitely he, think it's useful. It seems super useful. Yeah. So, I mean, the, yeah. the thing I'm excited about here is that if we can push this uh, as its own standalone standard, um, then we can get wide adoption for it and wide use of it, which will make it much easier for us to use ENS and also ensure a wider community of builders are, are building on the standard and, and, and helping make it robust. Um, because if this is useful as general infrastructure, then, then everything gets, you know, people build all sorts of tooling around it. Life is much easier for all of us. Um, and speaking of which, uh, I've just been calling it L2 Gateway. It clearly needs a better name than that. Uh, I don't expect anyone to come up with anyone any of the second, but if you think of any in the next week, please uh, post them somewhere. Uh, one thought on it being a standard, um, having having every different gateway for every function call uh, seems more ENS specific. Uh, I'd imagine like in a more general sense, like most contracts would have a gateway per contract. Uh, and yeah. that might be more efficient than the three point step. So as far as the standard goes, kind of supporting both ways might, might uh, be more efficient. Yeah, and I think the, like the, um if you ignore the, the need for indirection that ENS has, the easiest way would be to modify the spec, the ABI spec, so that an ABI entry can specify a gateway URL, either for that specific entry or for, for all of them. Um, the, the question is how to support that model as well as the ENS model. And maybe it's just that if you want it dynamic, then you have some function named X that returns the gateway URL for the whole contract, um, which is OK. I was just mentally trying to avoid something where you have to consult the contract three times, you know, an extra time just to know which gateway to talk to. Um, but that's definitely something we can iterate on, I think. Um, so, uh, so in addition to the gateway URL, can we just also add like a like an attester address or something, and all of the results from the the, the gateway will have to be signed by that attester address? Does that make sense? Um, I think that pushes some of the details about how you prove a result into the application layer, whereas they've previously been down to the contract and the gateway. Um, because then we need to, to, to know, you know, how is the attester trustworthy and so on. Uh, at the moment, you could implement that model by having the contract check for a, a signature from the, the attester. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, the, the reason why I, you know, mentioned, um, the uh, the result from gateway being cryptographically signed and being important is you know because you know in certain countries DNS is not trustworthy at all you know like mm -hmm. like in China yeah. for example you're definitely gonna have some kind of man in the middle attack from yeah. like state actor even so uh, yeah. so I think it might be important to have that as part of the spec 
uh, as, as opposed to being like left to the implementer. Mm -hmm. I mean, the worst that the gateway can do is return invalid results because any, uh, which you'll know because you'll detect either an invalid prefix or the contract will say this isn't valid. Um, and in that case, I think it's just as effective uh, for whoever's trying to do this to take the gateway offline, which is something we can't prevent with SSL and so on. So if a state level actor wants to, to attack a gateway, their most effective route is to simply make sure it can't answer queries uh, rather than, than imitate it. Because by imitating it, all you can do is give the same invalid results that you'll detect immediately. Gotcha. Um, one other, right. one kind of interesting thing you can do in this model, just, just kind of thinking about the general model more, is, and I mean, you, you kind of joked about this in, in, for the ENS, like, you know, just run a custom blob of JavaScript, but there is kind of an argument, let's say, you know, for the verification contracts, you know, defining the hash of some WebAssembly code. Um, and, you know, if, for instance, the logic for verifying was difficult to write in Solidity, if we're just mm -hmm. talking about kind of client-side verification, um, it's not, there's not that much difference between like, you know, trust, you know, assuming that the Solidity code in this, in this verifier contract is actually, actually implemented correctly and assuming that the hash of the WebAssembly code and the WebAssembly code it represents that's committed to by the verification contract is implemented correctly. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a fair point. I guess the, one of the goals is to keep the work that the client has to do minimal and pulling in a whole like WebAssembly VM is, is not exactly minimal. But on the other hand, they're reasonably well established now and they're re I think they're reasonably well sandboxed. So maybe just saying, hey, you know, here's one of three WebAssembly libraries, pull in one of them and execute this blob isn't as bad. Um, but it does, it still does seem less minimal. I, I think, uh, I think I'd want to see a compelling example of something that's quite difficult to do this way before introducing the extra complexity personally. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I think about this, I'm thinking about, yeah, I mean, it, it might not turn out, it might, there might not be any use cases and I definitely wouldn't start with that. Um, but I'm, I'm imagining particularly kind of for handling more complex um, call resolution with kind of more, more complicated logic. Um, yeah. That kind of funneling all the verification through um, through a Solidity contract, even you know, call not you know, but would would be a lot of yeah mess. <laughs> yeah, um, and I mean, uh, I guess the other thing to bear in mind with that is that verifiers will likely need to read re chain state. So if you did have you know WebAssembly verifier that's expected to be run on the client, you're also going to have to have. Um, you're going to have to have, uh, I forget the name momentarily, interfaces between the WebAssembly VM and the chain state that go off and fetch stuff, um, which does further complicate that a bit. Okay. okay. Um, I think we're out of, we're basically out of time now. Um, I think that was pretty productive. Uh, I'm thinking probably the most sensible next steps are, um, I'll summarize this uh, on the discussion board. Um, and perhaps we can start asynchronously um, working on uh, fleshing this out as, as an actual spec, at least a prototype spec, rather than just a demo, um, and start working on, on other things that, you know, build on it and, and just getting it firmer. And then maybe schedule a, a next meeting for when we have something concrete to build on and we have issues that need sort of discussing interactively. Um, maybe in the region of two weeks from now. Does that sound reasonable to people? Uh, in terms of participation, like you mentioned, like it sounds like there's a lot to do on the client library. And uh, it's good that like, you know, Richard is here for ESL.js, but is it worth reaching out to other like server side library, like you know, Web3J or like Python or this? On I think the yeah, I mean, I think step one is obviously codifying more more strictly what we're actually attempting to do or, you know, what the standard will look like because we don't want to get six people working on client libraries that then all turn out to be to need updating. Um, and getting at least one, say, JavaScript implementation, which is basically my, you know, L2 gateway.js only more robust and less of a demo. 
um, get at least one implementation that, that actually works. And then we can start talking about when the spec's a bit more solid about making this work everywhere. Okay. All right. Um, and if anyone wants to volunteer for, for work relating to this, be it working on, you know, implementations of, of clients or more exam more concrete examples or glue between a particular L2 so that because then this first demo, I picked the, the Merkle token thing because it's very straightforward and easy to build on. Um, but it would be nice for demo number two to be like one of our existing prototype L2s actually, you know, interacting, not necessarily ENS resolution, but definitely something from an actual mutable L2 rather than a fixed list of Merkle routes. Um, so if anyone's interested in, in picking up something like that, uh, please get in touch and we can coordinate. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thank you, mate. Thanks. 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 Yeah. What is going on? Uh, we can maybe try.